some that are getting some friends. This there are some that are getting friends through uh, multiplayer video games, and I'm not suggesting banning that, but it should not be the only way that they get friends. I was just reading a rather review a rather discouraging book in today's Wall Street Journal about anxious teens in general, and we need to be limiting the device use and getting them out doing more real things. Again, not banning devices. How about an hour a day on social media? Period. One hour a day. When I was a child, TV was limited to one hour a day. Yeah, you don't ban it, but they we need to get them out doing things. So great activities for kids are things like Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, uh, 4-H, FFA. If your school has FA, FFA, get the kids in that. It teaches public speaking. It teaches discipline. Thank you for that answer. What should caregivers and educators of the neurodivergent be doing to be sure that they're doing the best that they can for their youth? Well, you see, these are very top-down generalized questions. See, and this is the difference between verbal thinking and maybe picture thinking and even mathematical thinking. See, my mind thinks in specific examples. Okay, we have the kid that might be doing well in school, but yet bullied. That's making the life miserable. You've got the kid that's got a chaotic, bad home situation. I, uh, you know, there's a whole lot of different things. Uh, then you've got the autistic kids got more severe symptoms. Well, those usually they find those, but you get the kid that's you know fully verbal, um, and you know they start getting in trouble and. But I think of specific examples where there was a problem, and then I think of specific examples where the child got into the school band, and that was a great place where they could get some friends. See, I don't think in top-down generalities. I can't even answer those questions. I only think in specific examples. See, it's what's called bottom-up thinking. Okay, getting, getting back to more specific questions. Um, the question I believe we were asking was, how do I help my six-year-old verbal son overcome his negativity towards himself and help him to not self-harm? All right, like we have two issues here. We've got the negativity and we have the self-harm. Let's just deal with the negativity. Well, if you can be good at something, then, then you're probably going to have a more positive attitude. I try to find out something this kid could be good at and encourage that. Mother always encouraged my ability in art. Now, a kid can get really fixated on one thing, like maybe a certain type of car. Well, what you want to do is broaden that. Uh, you can learn about the history of that car. You can read about where it's manufactured. You see, I'm broadening it so it's not quite so fixated. You can learn how cars work. That's broadening that fixation. Now, the self harm, I want to find out what's bringing that on. Um, you know, it may be frustration. Uh, and maybe if you reduce the negativity, that would help. But a lot of uh, self harming stuff has some sensory basis. It's where you need to work with someone like an OT that's trained in sensory integration. That can often be helpful. Um, but that self-harm is something you want to get that stopped. And you're going to need some professional help on that. Another um, more specific question. <clears throat> Can you please provide insight into why sometimes my nonverbal seven-year-old daughter will completely destroy the normal order of things, such as pulling all of the blankets or towels out of the linen closet or tearing up cups and spreading mess all over the house. Is there any way to tell if she's angry or triggered by something or is she being creative? Well, let's just look at three things that are very common that can cause behavior problems. And the first thing is, does she have a good way to communicate? I can remember the frustration of not being able to communicate. You've got to have a way to communicate. You know, it's just a picture board, something to communicate with. And there's quite a few nonverbals that can learn to type independently. And if you want to try that, um, you have to use a tablet because they cannot do the attention shift. Like if I look down at this keyboard, 
that print's appearing up here. They can't do that attention shift. That's why you use a tablet. Um, the other thing is hidden painful medical problems that they cannot tell you about. That can cause behavior problems. And acid reflux and stomach problems are probably big number one to look for. Constipation, you know, like sinus infections, earaches, uh, toothaches, and then sensory overload. Is this happening when there's a bunch of noise going on? Those are some of the really common things. Those are the three most common. Now, the fourth possibility, if this ripping up the stuff in the house comes completely out of the blue, in other words, there's nothing that seems to trigger it, it might be a psychomotor epilepsy. But those are extremely difficult to diagnose because you have to do an EEG sleeping with no sedatives. I mean, they're very hard to hard to uh, diagnose because they'll tear the wires off. But when that, but the clue to that is if it's completely just random, this happens. You know, and then the towels are thrown around all over the place or whatever. But I'd rather look for the more obvious. Does the individual have, the, have a good way to communicate? I don't know. It could be sign language. It can be a communication device. It could be a picture board. It could be, but got to have a way to communicate. That's the first thing you want to check out. Thank you for that answer. Another uh, more specific question. My verbal seven-year-old son eats only about 10 things. Mm. All are processed and unhealthy. Should I just accept it or should I try to find a different option? Well, the thing I'm concerned with kids that have a very limited diet is getting the old fashioned vitamin deficiency diseases that we used to study in home economics, things like scurvy, very, very um, allegra, real nasty diseases. And recently I ran into a case of scurvy, which is vitamin C deficiency because the child was eating such a limited diet. So the first thing I'd wanna do is let's give them a good quality multiple vitamin so we can not get those dreadful diseases. Now he's eating 10 things. I need to know what the 10 things are. And one of the ways to help uh, broaden the diet, let the child get involved with food preparation where they can go in the kitchen and they can play in it. You can play in it, handle it. And, and that can sometimes help broaden the diet, get the kid involved in making the food. That can sometimes help. But some of these very limited diets, uh, it's like three things they eat. And I get really worried about nutritional deficiency. 10 things, I want to know what they are. And a lot of times it's it's uh, chicken nuggets, uh, french fries. You know, there's just a few things like that. Pizza, you can put different stuff on it gradually. And, you know, but I'm concerned that you don't want a kid ending up with a old vitamin deficiency disease that some doctors don't even know how to diagnose anymore. Because if you eat a varied diet, you don't get them. That's what worries me about that. Mm -hmm. But get them, in, get them out in the kitchen, let them play in it, uh, help, have them help make it. That might help reduce that problem. All right, this next question, we're going to change course just a little bit, and it's really a two-part question. Um, we're going to put them together as a, as a coupled question. What can employers do to work with the skills of the neurodivergent, and how can employers best mentor or counsel their neurodivergent staff when those staff do not meet, meet the needs of an organization? Well, let's just start with some of the basics of work, showing up on time. And that was something at work, I didn't have a problem with that. And that was pounded into me. And I really understood time. Another issue can be hygiene. There's a scene in the HBO movie where they slam the deodorant down, that happened. There are some things you have to conform with and you just can't, you're gonna have to conform on some hygiene things. And, and uh, you know, there's all lots of different, options now i didn't like the gunky deodorants i had in the 70s but he's a solid stick I can't, I can't even feel it once it's on um you know that that's stuff that you know you need to be working on um 
that one of the most common accommodations that's needed is a lot of people that have autism cannot remember long strings of verbal sequential instructions, like how to close out a cash register at Walmart, make a pilot's checklist for the steps for closing out the cash register. That would help a lot. Pilot's checklist would save a ton of jobs. Okay, these are just very, very simple things. Now, the other thing is being vague does not work. And I actually had some very good job coaching done with me uh, by people that, you know, just were real practical. And I criticized some welding and I said, it looked like pigeon doo-doo. My very first job, the plant engineer pulled me into his a little office down in the boiler room. I remember the Swift plant in Arizona. And he said, I had to apologize for that kind of language. He told me in private, quietly, what I should do and was not vague about it. That's what he did. He didn't get mad. He explained in private what I should do. You can't just say, well, John's rude with customers. You have to be much more specific about what, about how to learn how to not be rude to customers. Vagueness doesn't work. They need to be told, and it's similar to children. Like when I was a young child in the 50s, grownups corrected little kids. So like if I went in the store and I was touching too much stuff, the clerks would say, only touch the things you're going to buy. See, that's giving the instruction. Or they might say, use the fork uh, to eat, not your hands. You know, some foods you can, are okay, like a hamburger you can pick up with your hands, mashed potatoes, absolutely not. And in the moment, you give the instruction. I call it a teachable moment. In the moment, you give the instruction. And you don't get mad. You don't scream no. You explain what they should do. Just calmly and quietly. That's what you do. Dr. Grandin, it can be very difficult to find mentors and advocates in rural areas. What are some ways the neurodivergent and their caregivers can find or create their own support systems? Well, all right, let's look at little kids first. Let's say we're in a situation where there's no services or you're waiting two years for diagnosis. Well, you don't want to wait two years. You wait until a two-year-old's about five before you start working on them. Well, that's where you may to maybe get some grandmother volunteers in the community to work with the kid. And I see a lot of situations where one hour of speech, one hour of OT a week. I run into that all the time. Well, that's enough time for that professional to be a coach, teach some volunteers how to work with the child. Um, now, older the mentors, there were some, you know, I have to say that Harley Winkleman, the plant engineer at Swift Plant, was a very good job coach. I remember being pulled into that boiler room as if it happened yesterday. And he did exactly the right thing. In private, told me what I should do quietly. And then I had to go do it. You know, you, you know, there's these kids that are uh, young adults are addicted to video games. There's been some real successes with slowly introducing auto mechanics. And they have found that fixing cars was more interesting than video games. And they've gone into professions of fixing cars. That's wonderful. See, there's a lot of things in the community. You know, some the farmer might be willing to work with them. There's more things around than you think. That might be a really good segue for the next question. I have a senior uh, male student who struggles greatly with reading, but is a whiz with facts and fairly good with math. Can you please suggest jobs that might be a good match other than retail sales? Please remember this is a small rural area and there is no transportation for this individual. Now, this has been one of the big barriers is the transportation. That has been one of the big barriers for a lot of good programs. And I learned to drive on my aunt's backcountry dirt roads. And I think most of the verbal ones can learn to drive, but it's going to take a whole lot longer I did 200 miles on dirt roads to my aunt's mailbox, six miles, six times a week, 
before I went near any traffic. You've got to spend more time getting the driver in, into motor memory. So you don't have to think about the pedals. I learned on a, on a standard transmission. We started out in the middle of the horse pasture. Now, now I realize, of course, most of non-verbal individuals are not going to be able to drive. But there's a lot of verbal individuals that are not learning to drive. And when I say a totally safe place, I'm talking the middle of a giant open field, middle of a big parking lot at six o'clock in the morning. So if that car lurches 50 feet, it's not going to hit anything. That's what I'm talking about. Would you have, um, would you be able to suggest jobs that might be a good match for such an individual that still can't rely on transportation? Maybe it's an age-related issue, I'm assuming. Well, oh yeah, if it's an age-related issue, they're not going to be able to drive, obviously. Um, the, uh, see, I have to learn more about the community and then I visualize something that maybe they could do. Um, there's farms around, maybe there's something on a farm they could do. Um, the dairy has got baby calves. That might be a good job. Um, see, a lot of the people, see, you know, I talked about the visual thinkers like me, the stuff we're good at, art, mechanical, anything mechanical, John Deere is hiring technicians right now. Um, photography and animals. Those are the things that my kind of mind's going to you know, Mathematicians going to be computer programming, chemistry, physics, all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> Music. Music and math go together. And then your word thinker. This is the kid that loves baseball statistics or historical facts. Those are the kinds of things this kind of kid likes. And, and I want well, some of the jobs that have been very successful have been specialized retail jobs that are quiet environment, like a farm supply store, for example. And they've got really great knowledge of all the tractor parts. And that's something that people would appreciate. Those are some of the things they'd be good at. So one of the problems we got with autism is you, it's such a huge, gigantic, big spectrum. With the increase in autism diagnoses over the past decades, do you believe this is due to any recent environmental changes or through the lack of knowledge about the disorder in the past? I think most of it's increased detection. You see, the, the spectrum has been broadened. You see, back when, the, when I was a child, in the 80s, you had to have speech delay in order to be labeled autistic. If there was no speech delay, you weren't labeled autistic. Then they added Asperger's in the early 90s. That's socially awkward, no speech delay. Then in 2013, they merged everything together. So now you've got Silicon Valley programmers and somebody who can't dress themselves with the same name. And I think... Another thing that's happened in order to get services, there's some that probably have intellectual disability, which is the main problem, labeled autism to get services. So I think most of it's just increased detection. And the other thing I think that's making things worse is these kids are just getting on the screens. I was just reading uh, in the today's Wall Street Journal about this book about you know, anxiety in teens. And I don't think COVID's helped th matters any. I've been finding since COVID, there's been some motivation problems with students. You know, I, I was reading in the paper about, um, okay, here's a senior student. Okay, her graduation's canceled. This was COVID. Um, her summer job was canceled. Her internship was canceled. I'm just thinking about if I was that age and all my dreams were canceled, I might have a harder time recovering from that than being an older person subjected to COVID. You know, I've thought about that. You know, what if all the stuff I was going to do was just canceled when I was that age? But I think most of it's, um, it is the, the, the definition of autism has been broadened. All right, we're going to switch gears just a little bit again. 
Today, special interest groups are fighting for the banning of books. Some of these books feature neurodivergent characters or feature neurodivergence as a theme or as a topic. How do you feel about this? When the potato gets too hot, I drop it. Period. <laughs> <laughs> All right, switching gears again. How accurate was the movie that was made about you? I found it very interesting and enlightening. Well, one thing in the movie that's very accurate is it shows my visual thinking. That's shown accurately. It shows the projects that I have designed. That's accurate. And it shows the main characters, like my mother, Mr. Carlock, my science teacher, Anne at the ranch, uh, really nicely. But I really like the fact that it shows visual thinking accurately. And the thing is, we need people that are visual thinkers. We have a huge shortage of people to, rep to repair stuff. I've been on a lot of elevators lately that are questionable. We need the skills of neurodivergent people. I'm going to be very, very adamant about that. We need the skills. I look, I was just in New York and they're building these big skyscraper apartments. Well, I'm thinking about the water pumps you gotta have in that building. If you wanna get water on the 60th floor. The verbal thinkers don't think about that until they break. <laughs> I think about it before it breaks. You know, it's, um, you wanna have the power and, and water and stuff like that. I can tell you right now, you're gonna need neurodivergent people. You wanna keep this stuff going. That's where I come from. That's perhaps uh, a good segue to the next question. How can the neurodivergent discover their skills, especially if they've been diagnosed as an adult and haven't been permitted or encouraged to find their strengths? Well, basically, I'm a big believer in exposing. Let's start with young people. If you expose kids to lots of different things, then you can find out what they're good at. I had a little flute when I was a child. I was terrible at playing mm -hmm. music. Uh, I can sing, but I, I can't synchronize my rhythm. I can never figure out how to work the finger holes. So I was exposed to a flute. That did not work for me. But for another child, it will. Now, I went more the art route. I liked building things out of cardboard. Those are the things that, um, I, that I like. But you see, how are you going to find out what a kid might be good at if they're not exposed to enough stuff. I'm seeing kids that are good at Legos and nobody thinks to expose them to tools. And that child could grow up and fix John Deere tractors. They're hiring right now for technicians. I see technicians hiring signs on farm on John Deere dealerships and I go buy them. You see, I'm thinking of something that's a specific example. We need people to work on this stuff. We need them real badly. And we need the skills. This stuff we don't make. We don't make the state-of-the-art electronic chip-making machine. I think taking hands-on classes out of the schools is one of the worst things they ever did. When I was in elementary school, I loved sewing, woodworking, and art. Loved those classes. No, you've got to expose kids to lots of different things to see what they gravitate towards. Okay, you've got a little a third grader that's forced to do baby math over and over again. It's turned into a gigantic behavior problem. All right, he needs that algebra book. I never could figure out algebra. But that algebra book's a doorstop for me. For that other kid, it's a door. <laughs> He'll give them the algebra book. Expose them to the higher math. That's what you need to do with little math kids that are turning into behavior problems. Give them harder math to do. Then they won't be behavior problems. The behavior problems because they're bored. But you've got. But how could you find out if a child was good at playing musical instruments? if they were never exposed to musical instruments. You know, they might try drumming on, you know, a wastebasket or something for a drum. But they could display their talent a lot better if they had access to musical instruments. You know, you, you know I always say you've got to expose kids to interesting things to get them interested in interesting things. I was exposed to that optical illusion room that was shown in the movie and I was challenged by my science teacher to figure out how to build it
So Dr. Grandin, would you say making sure that we provide access to our young people and also young adults who have maybe just recently gotten diagnosed is key? Well, a lot of, di you know, autism, you know, uh, young adults that are recently diagnosed, um, you know, some might already be in jobs. I have a book, Different Not Less, they're all employed and where the like, diagnosis helped us in their relationships. It was almost a relief for some of these adults to get diagnosed later in life. But one of the things that's made my life worthwhile is having a career that's interesting, a career where I'm doing things. And right now, at the age I'm at now, I want to help these kids that are different to get into good careers. That's my interest right now. Dr. Grandin, this isn't actually a question, but I was fortunate enough to hear you speak in, in Chickasha just a few weeks ago. Okay. Um, you spoke of a uh, nonprofit organization out of Denver. Would you mind taking a moment to explain that situation to our audience? It's TACT, Teaching Autistic Community Trades. And what they do there, and it's been very successful, they have about a 70% rate of getting people into jobs. And they have a two-week exploration camp where you can try out different trades, uh, carpentry, cybersecurity, fixing cars, welding. Um, and then they like for the auto mechanics, they have a two semester class, six students per class, and there's two teachers in the class. There is an auto mechanic teacher and a job coach teacher. And they are expected to show up there like for work on time, not slobs. Um, you have to hot work babe. Then TACT has contracts with local car dealerships. And they, they uh, at the, after the end of the class, they're placed with a car dealership. And then there's a job coach there for another two months going into the workplace. It's been very successful. And another other projects that have worked well is Project Search. And they have long internships. And they start out just with hospital jobs, but now they then they have, then you fill up the hospitals and then you've got to branch out to something else to do. Thank you for that insight. Switching gears a little bit again, how did sexism affect your ability to be taken seriously in your early career? And what advice would you give to young women today? Well, one of the things that helped me was there's a scene in the HBO movie where I go up and I get the editor's card and I started writing for our state farm magazine. And I wrote really good, accurate summaries of the cattle feeders meeting. That helped to give me credibility. I was a good livestock editor. I, my writing, I wrote it. And then also I would show off my drawings. I'd show off my work. I sold, here's one of my drawings right here. I would show people my work. Not drawing and came. Yeah, I would show off my drawings. I showed my work off. I learned to sell my work rather than myself. But starting to write for that magazine was very important for my career. And I had the guts to go up and get the card. And then then I said, and then I produced an article that summarized my master's thesis on cattle handling and different squeeze shoots. And then I'm and then I suggested doing a column for them. And then six months later, they hired me for livestock editor. But I saw that door to opportunity. Another thing that, that students are not doing now is when they get into trouble, let's say in college, they don't ask for help quickly enough. When I failed my first math quiz, I went to the teacher and I asked for help. And I had somebody ask me, well, how'd you have the guts to do that? Well, I think it goes back to selling candy for charity as a young child, collecting money for UNICEF. You had to, you had to go up and talk to people to do that. And when in my neighborhood, when you were eight years old, you had to put your good clothes on and be hosting hostess at the parents' parties. That taught social skills. Then I had the guts to go up there and ask for the car to also instead of flunking out of the class, I got help from the professor. I asked for help on my first failed quiz. And somebody asked me on, this was at a student association meeting last night. They asked me, well, how did you have the guts to do that? Well, it goes back to the selling candy for charity. You know, these kind of things that little, 
selling Girl Scout cookies. And the, and the kid needs to sell the cookies, not the parents. It teaches really important skills. You just gave me um, personal appreciation of my own upbringing, Dr. Grandin. Thank you for that. Well, you see, I think we need to be doing some of that 50s upbringing and, and, and the teachable moments. It wasn't done in a nasty way. But let's say I reached across the table for the mashed potatoes. Mother didn't scream no. She'd say, ask your sister to pass it. That's what she would say. All right. This is a question kind of out of left field, but minds want to know. Do you write in uppercase letters primarily? Because in the movie, most of your letters were character written on, on the pictures were in uppercase. One of my students also writes in mostly uppercase. No, I wrote in upper and lowercase. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, well, and I handwrite a lot of stuff. My typing on a computer is one finger. On <laughs> NPEC. I bet it's not easy to write a dissertation that way. No, it's not. And I, <laughs> I, I'll be honest, I had a professional typist type the dissertation. The next question is, rural organizations and schools are grossly underfunded and understaffed. How can rural areas provide resources for folks within the spectrum when they are already struggling to get by? All right, that's way too vague. I'm gonna have to be asked a specific question. Uh, let's try looking at some volunteers in the community, find somebody in the community to teach a teenager auto mechanics. See, now I'm thinking about the junky old airplane hangar I went into and, and there was a couple of guys there fixing up an ancient old airplane and it was out in the rural area and I'm going boy that'd be a great place for a teenager to learn how to fix up an old airplane there's more you see I just see things that are specific examples I go that that's just great well then one of the warehouses at Future Horizons that's my book publisher a uh, little industrial warehouse they rented Next door was a custom motorcycle shop. And I went into the custom motorcycle shop and I said, boy, there are kids that would love that. There's more stuff like that around even the rural areas than what, what you think. You're just not seeing it. You know, that'd be the kind of stuff good for my kind of find. There's a lot of retirees that are bored that would like to teach a kid math. Then maybe that retiree goes to your church. You know, networking. So you're getting too locked into the label. There's more stuff around than you'd think. The transportation is a huge issue. Well, and you might have to start thinking about, all right, let's say the kid's working at Walmart. Maybe he can carpool with some other employee that lives nearby. So essentially, um, you would encourage folks to kind of think outside of the box and to- Well, yes, I know. Not... You see, I'm thinking about, like I remember going down to Brazil and uh, a bunch of other countries, they had all these little tiny bitty shops. I'm looking at those and I'm going, ooh, perfect place for the 12 year old after school to help out in a little clothing store, the fruit stand. So I'm always thinking about things where, where, um, because we need to be making a slow transition from school to work. And that's where, we're, you know, I'd like to have fully verbal kids uh, two summer jobs uh, and under that belt before they graduate. So I'd like to see. Thank you, Dr. Grandin. Um, we, we have another question from one of our youngest participants today. Um, I, I hope you take it in good humor. Um, the question is, why did the cowboys throw bull testicles at your car in the movie? Well, that actually happened, and he just did it to be mean. And it was a foreman that did that. 
you know, where I had the most problems with that kind of stuff, it was foreman. So it was middle management did that kind of stuff to me. You know, and that actually did happen. Dr. Grandin, I have a question. Out of all of your books, um, everything from autism and education to visual thinking to calling all minds, um, which one would you recommend for parents to start, especially if um, they're, you're trying to encourage them to look outside of the box? Oh, well, let's start with three-year-olds. I've got some. I've got a book called Autism and Education, mm -hmm. the way I see it. It's a little gray book. And um, that'd be good for a parent with a newly diagnosed three-year-old. I have a rather thick brown book called The Way I See It that has a lot of little short articles uh, on a lot of different subjects from early intervention to jobs. Um, things like, like, okay, my visual thinking book, I wouldn't recommend that for three-year-olds, but I'd recommend for um, you know looking at whole job situation, teenagers and adults, probably these two books, Visual Thinking and the Autistic Brain, for ideas on jobs. Um, then I have the different, not less, that's adults diagnosed later in life, all working, describing their work experiences. So that'd be a good book for adults. The Unwritten Social Rules would be a good book for fully verbal adults. Then I've got my kids' project books, like Calling All Minds. That'd be for elementary school kids, any elementary school kids' projects. I, but what's happening is... What drives me crazy is I go back and forth between the autism world and the industrial world is I worked with people that owned shops that were definitely neurodivergent that had multiple patents. But these people are all my age now. They're not getting replaced. Who's going to fix things? Who's going to keep the water system running? I'm seeing half constructed, super big, high rise, slender apartment buildings. They're building right now in New York. I saw them just the other day. Yeah, you're going to need people that care about that water system. And the autistic person is the one that's going to care about it and keep it working. So if you're on the 60th floor, you're going to have water. If you can bear with us just a few moments longer, I think we have three or four last minute questions. Okay, let's questions. just finish those up and then we will have gone for an hour. Okay. Okay. Just off the top of your mind, Dr. Grandin, um, outside of farms and abandoned old aircraft, what are some other um, other potential possibilities for youth in Well, warfare? one poss well, when I was 13, there was a local lady that uh, out of her home did dressmaking and uh, dress alterations and mother had me work for for her two afternoons a week, I took apart dresses, I hand hemmed them. That was just in the community. That was a sewing job in the community. Just somebody working out of their house. And I was I was 13 and I did that two afternoons a week. So that has nothing to do with airplanes, but it's another specific example. You know, there's all, all kinds of things. And that mother did have to drive me to that job. It was not within biking or walking distance. But again, that was just found in the community. How about helping out an old per older person? Come over in the afternoon, and help clean Mrs. Jones's house. Now, I know in some rural areas, houses are too far apart to do that. How about church volunteer jobs? But I think it's very important that the boss is somebody outside the family. All right, the next question is, I have a teenage boy who is brilliant and really smart, but has no social skills. Are you still learning social skills? Oh, yes, yes, I'm always learning, <laughs> I'm always learning. But he's got to learn social skills being instructed. I'd recommend if he's fully verbal, read my unwritten social rules book. I think you'll find that helpful. And Sean Barron's my co-author. And there's a lot of things where Sean and I are the same. But there's other things where Sean and I are different. And I think you'll find that interesting. What was Sean's last name? What? I'm sorry. The author named Sean. What was his last Sean name? Barron. Sean Barron. It's Temple Grandin and Sean Barron. 
we'll be purchasing that for the library. Okay. Yeah, you can, and that's, um, but they have to, you know, they have to kind of learn the social rules sort of like being in a play. You can't walk up to somebody and tell them they're stupid. I did some stuff like that when I was young. That doesn't go over real well. <laughs> Did you really build a cattle type chute? Did it actually calm you down like the movie? Yes, it showed? did. And you can, and that's fully explained in my thinking and pictures book right here. Yes, I actually did. All of all the things I built that were shown in the movie are true. And they would build off original drawings. Do you feel like modern day compression vests, weighted blankets replace that? Yes, and they're much cheaper alternatives, and they can sometimes be helpful. While we're talking on sensory things, let's talk about some ways to help kids with noisy things. Hair dryers, vacuum cleaners, let the child control the noisy thing. Let the child turn that vacuum on and off. And I have seen vacuums go from scary, awful things to favorite toys when the child could control them. That's happened with battery-operated leaf throwers. Uh, but, uh, okay, later on in high school, electric drills in shop and noisy tools. The, the child go down there when it's not nobody's there and just turn this stuff on and off and make all kinds of racket with it where they turn it on and off. The control is really important. And the other problem I'm seeing is kids wearing headphones all the time or adults wearing headphones all the time. It's going to make your sound sensitivity worse. Mm -hmm. If you ever had wax in your ears and then the doctor cleans out the wax, everything sounds really loud. Well, the brain's trying to compensate. So what you want to do is have the headphones with you. I was in a hotel two weeks ago where the fire alarm went off three times in one night. Mm -hmm. That's actually ha happened. And that's a place for the headphones. You put them on when that happens. You put the headphones on in the horrible bathrooms where everything is hand dryers and all the kinds of equipment going off at random intervals. That's a place for the headphones. But then other places take them off because if you wear them all the time, it's going to make the sound sen sensitivity worse. Mm -hmm. But you have them with you. So if that fire alarm goes off in the hotel, then you have it. So that's just some tips. Then another little tip is some individuals can see flicker on LED lights. So if they're doing putting in new lighting or something, please let's try to find ones that don't flicker. And the way you find them is you just take out a modern phone and you film the room in slow motion video. And then some individuals see a uh, print jiggle on the page. Just try some different pale colored papers. Experiment with different fonts and backgrounds on the computer. Some individuals prefer laptops and tablets. And the reason for that is laptops and tablets do not flip. And some of your big flat screens do. Well, that's just a few little tips on some sensory stuff that you can do that's easy. Right. It looks like this is the final question, Dr. Grandin. Do you have any siblings and do they have autism? No, they do not have autism. I'm the oldest of four siblings. I mean, I'm the uh, for four children, though. Oldest of four children. Now, folks in the audience, did I misspeak? Or are there any other any other questions? Now's your time. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I hope I gave you some insights that you can just take home and use. But I, there's a, all I can say is that we need the neurodiverse individuals because this computer stuff we're using right now would not exist if you didn't have autistic individuals making it. You know, we, we, need, we need these skills. We need them. We need the different kinds of minds. In my visual thinking book, I discuss about how the different kinds of minds can work together. No, we need them. Well, Dr. Grandin, we certainly appreciate your time. And most of all, we ex appreciate your expertise and, and lending it to us. Well, just hopefully got, give you some ideas you can take home and use. And, and I'm really concerned about the adult transition. I see too many parents too overprotected. I'm appalled at the number of teenage kids that have never gone shopping by themselves. Just go in a store by themselves, buy something, talk to the store staff. I'm 
that sub. It's not good. I'm taught some parents just can't let go. There's a tendency for the parent to always talk for the child. Like I'll be at the book table and, well, the child should come up and ask for the book to be signed. Not the parent. It's the same thing like selling the, the Girl Scout cookies. The child needs to approach the customers at the grocery store and, ask, and, try, and sell the cookies. Because that teaches the important skill that gave me the guts to ask for help from professors when I failed my first math quiz and go up and get the card from the editor. And those are easy things to do. Easy things that perhaps we just don't think about. Well, and they're easy, and a lot of these things, they don't cost anything to implement, like having a child uh, be party hostess, parents' parties, and greet guests. And my brother's not autistic. He said it helped him become a bank vice president mm -hmm. because he could talk to older men. He didn't like the parties. He hated them. But he said it actually helped him. And he is definitely not autistic. But in our neighborhood in the 50s, this is what kids did. Party hosts and hosts, it starts around seven and eight years old. And then a little older, I'd go around the neighborhood, get money for UNICEF. Then you had to ask people for it. You had to talk to them. Selling candy for charity, I did that. We also were naughty and got in the got up in the treehouse and had a candy fight. <laughs> All the candy. I, I remember doing that too. That wasn't that wasn't the best thing. But also <laughs> going up to the doors in the neighborhood, knocking on the doors to sell the candy. Just one quick question. Ask you how how her mom felt like what she developed into this kind of adult like what what was her mom's I mean obviously proud but like okay um I'm gonna try my best to to re-ask that question um it was just a question from the audience how okay. did, how did your mother feel once you achieved success obviously she was proud but what other emotions perhaps well she you? was most proud of me when I graduated from college because a lot of people People thought I was stupid and I wouldn't amount to anything. And that was one of the things that motivated me to do the dipping vat projects that were shown in the movie. I wanted to prove to people I was not stupid. That's what I wanted to do. That's what I wanted to do. Well, are there any... Now we've got to help these kids be everything they can do. I've had parents when they finally got their kid out in a job that they liked, like maybe an office supply store. That's a specific example of a successful job. And the parents said, he became an adult. He bloomed. He blossomed. These are quotes of some of the things parents have said when a fully verbal autistic teen got out into a job that was successful. Those were the exact words. Do you want to... Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, I have a question. We have an aero, uh, aerospace industry here in town, and they've actually recognized that individuals on the spectrum would make good employees, especially because the work requires repetition. Um, yep. and I, ha I have a student, the same one that I'd asked a question about before, who's very interested in doing it, but they told him that he would need strong reading skills. So my question isn't necessarily we need strong what reading skills and he does not have it. And so I'm my question is really for the uh, aerospace industry. How how would you go about encouraging them to giving the student the opportunity? Well, the problem is even for the people that I worked with on building equipment for the beef industry, uh, they had decent reading skills. That one guy I worked with, very autistic, social skills are horrible. Uh, yeah, you're going to have to have some fairly decent reading skills. Now, uh, because you do have to be able to read manuals, and and I had I had some things built by by two different welders. I didn't know that they couldn't read, and it caused a lot of problems on the job. I could have compensated for that if I'd known it. They could read the blueprints and the measurements, but the directions. Although I had directions on there, like do not bury the 
pump suction li line under the cement slab, concrete slab, which they did. I, yeah, for, for, I would say for the things that I worked with, they had to have at least a good sixth grade reading level. Now, I did not know how to read when I was eight years old, and mother taught me with phonics, just sounding out my words. Very, very simple, sounding out my words from the Wizard of Oz. What do you think the reading level of this kid is? He's uh, maybe first grade, if that, but he's, he's excellent with math. He's excellent with facts. He's excellent with anything that requires repetition. And he has great social yeah, skills. The problem I've got with the, with, you see, the, the uh, you see, with even the industry that I was in, uh, I'd have a lot of situations where I'd have, there'd be problems, like not being able to read safety information. I'd have problems with that. This, I'm trying to figure out now, how have you taught, how have you tried to teach reading? Have you tried different methods? Yes, um, he's currently a senior. And so for the last four years, we've started fresh every school year because he doesn't retain it. And he's it. not I, making any progress in reading. You know, the no, problem I, I've got, like if I'm running a big shop, let's say I'm running a beef plant, I'm, I got problems if they can't read the safety stuff. I, I've got problems with that. Now, if you're sixth grade level reading, you could read that just fine. Fifth or sixth grade level reading would be sufficient for reading safety. <clears throat> I wonder if maybe a reading pen, if that might be a way to help uh, convince. But if he's, and he's, now, how good is his math? What's his math level? We're doing algebra this year. He's doing algebra, but he can't read. Exactly. Now, yeah, and he's doing algebra just fine. And I've now there's jobs that you see. What is the aerospace job? What is it? It's a it's a factory. That's all I know. Well, that's the problem. It's a factory. They they yeah. put things together. Yeah, um, yeah. I'd like to get the reading better. What are they putting together? What is it? I'm sorry. I wish I could answer that, but I don't really know. It's okay. new. Yeah, because if you're working with chemicals that could be dangerous, that's where being able to read safety information is really important. You know, if he's just uh, like a clothing factory, it's less of an issue. I, um, you know, that's uh, he can do algebra, but he just can't read at all. Yeah, they they worked on it intently in middle school, and and uh, oh. and are they have they tried phonics, just sounding out. Words. Oh yeah, yeah. We have to start from the very basics. And is he um, speak at a normal level? He speaks very quietly, but he speaks well. Yeah, because all the people that see, I, like I worked with two welders that couldn't read. They were good welders; they could read drawings. Um, now, if I knew they couldn't read, then I'd explain everything to them. But we had a bad mistake made on a job when they didn't do some jigs correctly for uh, the cattle shoot. And they were able to fix the thing with a car jack. They were lucky because otherwise it would have been an expensive <laughs> rip out. And then I found out that the guy couldn't read. You know, now the kind of field steel work, I can make compensations for that. But there's a lot of jobs where my safety nerves are having a fit right now. You know, this guy was doing welding off a welder on the back of a truck and he just had his welder he had to deal with and not much else. But that's, uh, uh, so you've tried whole word methods of teaching reading and phonics. Yeah. He, and he doesn't he, seem to get he gains, any. Uh, he gained some momentum with reading throughout the school year, but then the summer comes and he loses his skills. The next school year, we start from the very beginning. So he doesn't remember, but he remembers the algebra. Yes. We started out with banking. He can do his banking. Um, he's in charge of his own money. So he can um, do that. He works with a job coach. He does that very well. We've tried many different jobs. He does them all well. Well, and there's other jobs where the reading would be less of an issue. You're, yes, you're right. Maybe stock and shelves in the um, 
Yeah, but even, yeah, and I guess you could recognize the products by the shape and the color of the labels. I'd sure like to get the reading up to higher, you know, a little bit better. They were done. Now, is he, able to, is he able to explain to you why he, can, why he can remember the algebra, but not the reading? I don't think he processes that information. For him, I think math is, like you said, visual. It's not something he can explain to, as to why he understands it. Does he have a good vocabulary? Fair. Just fair, yeah. Yeah, they, um, you know, there's other people that are autistic that NASA would hire in five seconds. And the other thing that NASA does not tolerate is anger. You throw a tool at NASA, you will be fired. <laughs> and the meatpacking plants are very, very strict on fighting and things like that. And the rule is you hit, you're fired. That's the rule. Right. Because of the knives. Every meatpacking plant has that rule. You hit, you're fired. Right. You just can't have fights when you have knives. Rule. NASA, NASA has basically have the same rule. And so what I did to compensate because I had problems with anger. I, when I was in high school, I switched from anger to crying. Yeah, I was miserable. <laughs> I had places I'd go hide, like in the electrical rooms. <laughs> I'd go hide. I, but then you don't get fired for crying. You get fired for anger. But NASA does not tolerate anger. You can't you see the problem in a factory is just too dangerous. No, I I worked with a very very good person. He punched a plant manager in the mouth, and he was fired for that. And he was kind of neurodivergent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's certain things with safety. You see, this is the issue. Let's see, um, you know, now there's some safety signs where they're symbolic, you know, those are easy to understand. And he's good at following signs and symbols and that sort of thing, but I appreciate you answering my question. Yeah, you know, but that's, uh, it's just really odd that he can remember, remembers the algebra, but he can't remember na uh, names of, world of things written. You started with like nouns and stuff like that first. And he's better at reading individual words rather than sentences. Yeah. Trying to trying to figure out how to put it all together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, this is a problem with autism. You see, you have so many levels. Mm -hmm. No, but I worked with the people that I worked with that were definitely autistic, um, the high level ones were they could definitely read decently. Now, where they what they had trouble doing was algebra. They couldn't do algebra, people I worked with. But they could make anything mechanical and they couldn't do algebra. But they could read all the safety stuff and now maybe he could get a job doing something with programming or mathematical things that's all on a computer, and then there are no safety issues. You see, then it would not be an issue if the job was on a computer terminal. Maybe you can do something mathematical, strictly mathematical for them. Yes. Rather than working in a factory, then there is no issue. That's maybe that's, that's the approach good. to take. Yeah, that's very good input. I just mentioned the factory work because it was actually the company that reached out to us searching for individuals on the spectrum, knowing that they worked could do well in a factory. Oh, well, there's a lot of them that do super well in a factory. They'll be super good. Mm -hmm. They will do really, really super well in a factory. Well, I need to get going. I've got to get I'm going out of town. And I've got to get ready for that. Thank you. Well, we definitely appreciate your time. And, and thank you for lending us all of your insight, Dr. Grandin. Okay, well, I think maybe I've given you some things that, that and there's plenty of, um, uh, you know, you take someone to fix elevators. Yeah, I can see somebody autistic just loving that job. That's going to require a sixth grade level of reading. Because you do have to be able to read manuals. 
that does not require algebra. Okay, fixing escalators. I see those torn up all the time in the airplane. I mean, in the airport, not in the airplane, the airport. And I'm going, oh, those belts look just like um, conveyors in the meatpacking plant that pull the escalator along or the moving sidewalk along. Okay, well, it's been good to talk to everybody. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, okay, Dr. Well, great to talk to you. Okay. I'm going to say goodbye. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Bye.